For kangaroos, the greatest challenges come from within their own society. For a male, there's only really one key lesson to learn in his life. To get to the top, he must become a fighter. The battles are so brutal that males need years of training to prepare. The effort is worth it because a champion fighter wins privileged access to the females. This meadow is a boot camp for aspiring boxers. Training starts as soon as a youngster is out of the pouch. Its mother is a handy opponent for a young joey learning the basics. But he's soon off in search of more sparring partners. The other grown-ups are not so tolerant of this lightweight. This male alone rules the meadow. He stands eight feet tall, his muscles hardened by years of sparring. Today, a challenger for his title has come forward. Full-blown fights are so dangerous, they're not entered into lightly. But when two males square up, it's time to clear the arena. Anything goes in these power struggles. Eye gouging is entirely within the rules. So is kicking below the belt. The dominant male's skill is already telling. Stakes are high. They risk broken bones and internal injuries. Suddenly, it's all over. The champion has beaten off the challenger, at least for now. tiny wonder that I've come halfway around the world to find, the blue ringed octopus. The ones that are found here around Sydney are called blue lined octopus because all running down the surface of the mantle you can see great big long neon lines. Oh look at that bright bright colour change, gorgeous! Um, but they're still in the blue ringed octopus group and to show you how it got its name, all I need to do is agitate it very slightly and you should see the plainly coloured animal take on incredible agitated colours. Bright neon blue circles. Look at that! Wow! It's just electric. These are classic warning colours and they're obviously used to intimidate animals that might want to feast on a blue ring octopus. That would be a very, very bad idea because this is one of the most toxic creatures on Earth. The glorious neon flash colours tell other predators to just swim on by.
In Australia, scientists are trying to increase marsupial numbers using artificial insemination, or AI. They've started with koalas because they're easy to handle and breed well. They hope to perfect the methods to help rare marsupials in the wild, like Grimpy, the hairy-nosed wombat. So how do you do AI? Well, first you have to collect some sperm. And to do that, you go to the Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary in Brisbane. What you're witnessing here is the courtship behaviour of Australia's national icon, the koala. This here is Tyson, and he's marking his territory there with his scent gland because he's been put in with the girls. If he plays his cards right, today could be his lucky day. Koalas are normally quiet creatures, but things are about to change. Titan has to go in and excite the females. Only then will keep a pool know if any of them are ready to mate. They want to collect Titan's sperm. The problem is, at the moment, he's really taking his time. If you don't perform, you're old. back in the boys' dorm. Yeah, I think he's getting old. Is we do have another male, younger male here who might do it the happens, job. It happens, doesn't it? <laughs> I wouldn't know. <laughs> Well, he is a bit younger. Paul has to introduce yes, what's called a teaser male. Oh, Liam? Who is it? <laughs> Liam. Liam, all right, Liam. So we just show Liam face to face. So we know she's in. She's definitely carrying on. He's interested. So can Liam get the girls going? <laughs> With young, hot-blooded Liam displaying, the enclosure reaches fever pitch. Head bobbing, bellowing, and scent marking. <laughs> Meanwhile, Titan just sits back and waits. Finally, one of the females is ready. But sorry, Liam, it's Titan's sperm they want. But remember, this is artificial insemination, so his sperm has to be collected. Steve Johnston has pioneered this technique. This is where the science comes into it. Well, it's not too much science. It's basically just collecting some sperm from the male and getting in between him and her. So you're the awful person that, at the crucial moment, nips in there? Absolutely. We'll just... The koalas seem to have no idea their nuptials are about to be interrupted. Steve gets in between them to collect Titan sperm in a device made partly from the top end of a cricket bat. He thinks completely that it's a female that he's doing the job on. Oh. Next coming, here we go. Poor Wendy is just getting bitten. She's not having much well, fun here at all. That's a very normal mating behaviour in koalas. I mean, and that'll stabilise a female while he uh, inseminates her. So that's perfectly normal. So and there we are. We've got our sperm sample. Yeah, that's probably all we need to, to do. That's probably enough. Have a look at it. It's that. finally time to artificially inseminate one of the females called Beta. The process is painless. The sperm is simply squirted into beta. If the AI is a success, in 35 days' time, a tiny baby koala will make its way into beta's pouch. The team will be one step closer to helping rare marsupials like Grimpy. I thought it looked cruel. But Mark said that if you control the crocodile with ropes, you allow it to go into its natural attack role, there he goes. which will exhaust the thing. That's it. Just move back a bit. Let him play. From yesterday, saying that crocodiles, you know, I didn't like them, what have you, you know, it must be pretty daunting for an animal to be locked in a pen like that for a while, and then for 20 big men to come in and attack it. Well, not attack it, but get it, rope it, roll it. it must be pretty scary for it. <laughs> I think that that mouth could easily kill me. Easily kill me. Only once it's tied out is it safe to do something about that mouth. OK, if I can have the guys that uh, we've nominated to jump them, from on this side here. They're now going to jump on it. You ready? Just controlled, go. 
It's amazing to think that covering its eyes and sitting on it actually calms the thing down. Enough to tape its mouth shut. It's just basic electrical tape. And that's enough to secure its jaws. You yeah. know what with that, right, yeah. Scotty? Yeah, I'm gonna, you just want to I think Mark right. was on a bit of a mission to change okay. my mind about these crocs. And Natalie, if you want to come in and take Bill's place on the machine, Bill that's the way. My place, are you? Oh, I'd like you to stay on the legs there if you're right. <laughs> and then you can actually feel it. You can feel the animal. Wow. That's the animal. I'm sitting on a croc. You guys comfortable? Yeah, Mum. Huh? Yep. Okay, the sack's coming off his eyes. I can't feel any movement. Completely still. Like sitting on a rock. Oh, I can now. What's he doing there? Was that the croc or Warren? No, it's not. Shut up, Scooter. So if you want to come up towards. Now, part of my team's job was to do a population study. We're about to sex him. Natalie. Natalie. <laughs> oh, I'm not doing that. What do you want me to do? You don't roll cigarettes, do you? Doing this study, Mark has handled enough crocodiles to know what makes them flinch, and sexing them, apparently, doesn't phase them. Yep. Now, the vent is up underneath here. Right. And you tell by the size. Yeah. So give me the hand. Oh. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Roll him. Roll him. Okay, so that's the vent there. Yeah. Okay, so what you've got to do is you've got to force your, your hand up into that. Yeah. Keep on forcing it. Yeah. And at some stage there, you're going to feel a really solid, like you're touching yeah. a finger. Okay? I reckon that's a female then. You reckon? Yeah. Oh, it's a bit big, so this is actually a male. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> For a male like this, I'd expect bigger. <laughs> If we, if we get him up here, and he's got the strain of his head there... Go, two, three, go! Just ten years ago, a crop like this one would have been shot. At least now he faces some kind of a future. Being a fertile male, he was being sent off to become a breeder in a crocodile farm. Then something really strange happened. I looked into that trailer, and I swear the crocodile looked right back at me. I had made eye contact with an 11-foot predator. Someone said to me, when I asked about a crocodile, if they like them or not, I don't really like them, but I have a lot of respect for them. And I do believe I agree with that <laughs> phrase. Respect is the only way, I think. But although Stella is inundated with roos and wallabies, none of them take up as much of her time as young wallaby Neil. He's an orphan from a car accident where his mum was killed, and Neil's been with us one week. Neil is just one and a half months old. In the wild, he'd be around nine months before he left his mother's pouch. He doesn't have a, a second coat. He's just got the light top coat that he has while he's in his mum's pouch. We do call them little velvets. I'm covering his eyes a little bit in Mum's pouch. It's a bit, it's darker than here. He's getting a bit used to it, so it's not too stressful. In the first three days here, he cried out at night time for his mum. That's heartbreaking to listen to him call out for his mum. What we do then is we pick them up and I put him in the bed with me so he can feel my heartbeat. The moment I picked him up and cuddled him and held him next to my heart, the crying stopped. Because they develop for so long in the pouch, the beating of their mother's heart is deeply comforting for baby marsupials. Research shows that maternal nurture physically changes brain chemistry and alters the way a youngster's body responds to stress. 
Without this closeness and reassurance, orphans have been known to die of anxiety. But with new animals arriving all the time, Stella can't always be there for Neil. And he urgently needs a companion the same size and age who he can hang out with.